Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> uh, on behalf of uh, Judge Kavanaugh and Judge Godola, welcome to our first of two days here in Grand Rapids uh, for our uh, call today. I know we've got a number of people here scheduled who are very familiar with our process, some uh, not as much. So just as a reminder, uh, 30 minutes per side, if you're sharing time with one of your co-counsels, please let us know in advance how you're gonna be uh, spending that time. Uh, I don't think we have anything today, although I may be wrong, uh, that involves any minor children. If there are any minor children that are involved in any cases, if you could please not identify the child uh, by name and instead uh, refer to them in some other way, I'll leave it to you to decide how you do that just to protect their privacy. Um, with that, uh, just as another general reminder, we're very familiar with all of the facts. Don't spend a lot of time, in fact, as little time as possible talking about the facts. We're familiar with the facts. We really want you to focus on the one or two issues uh, that, uh, are, that in your mind are uh, outcome determinative in this case and really tip the scales in your judgment in your favor. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn over and call our first case, which is a little out of order, but we're doing that to accommodate uh, a number of interests. And that is the uh, case of uh, item number six, William Bailey versus County of Antrim. That's uh, item number 357838. I see that the parties are already at the table. Uh, Mr. DiPerno, uh, you represent the appellant. If you could please uh, approach, I'll place your name on the record and uh, you can proceed, thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Honors. Um, may it please the court. Uh, my name is Matt DiPerno. I represent the plaintiff in this case, and the appellant, uh, William Bailey. Um, this case uh, is about a voter's right to conduct a statewide audit of the 2020 election pursuant to the Michigan Constitution, Article 2, Section 41H, which is effective December 22, 2018. Um, if I can distill this case down as simply as possible, I think uh, it is actually quite simple in terms of the interplay between uh, the constitutional uh, amendment and uh, section MCL 168.31a. Now this constitutional amendment states that any interpretation of the provision shall be liberally construed in favor of the voter and it states that all voters have the right to conduct an audit of the statewide elections as prescribed by law. The question I think in this case is what is an audit? Um, and the legal issue of what constitution, constitutes a constitutionally sufficient audit under section 41H remains unresolved uh, in this state. This is an issue of first impression uh, and it is an important uh, issue. It is a mixed question of law and fact that cannot be resolved under C4 or C8. And that we believe was a glaring mistake by the trial court when it dismissed this case under 2.116 C4, stating that the claims were moot and therefore the court did not have jurisdiction. What is most important, I believe, in this case is the first sentence of MCL 168.31a was added after the constitutional amendment was adopted. And it states that the Secretary of State shall prescribe the procedures for election audits that include reviewing the documents, ballots, and procedures used during an election as required in section four of article two of the state constitution of 1963. That word include is vitally important. That statute specifically states what the secretary must do. She, that audit, her audit as prescribed under 168.31a must include reviewing 
of documents, ballots, and procedures. At a minimum, include is a word that means, I believe, at a minimum, and I think that's clear under case law. The word include is not a word of limitation, but rather of enlargement, and that's Skillman versus Abruzzo, 352, Mish 29, 1958. So it includes, we believe, everything that occurred in this uh, election on November 3rd, 2020 in Antrim County. We know that in Antrim County, they used voting machines uh, in that election. And therefore, by use of the word include, the plaintiff was entitled to a review of the computer systems, the software, any attached equipment, any modems, connections, communication devices, ballot images, the ballots themselves. Uh, we did not get any of that as the plaintiff. What happened, as we know, there was a hand recount conducted on December 17, 2020. <laughs> However, during oral argument, <clears throat> um, Secretary of State, her attorneys acknowledged that that audit or that hand recount was not an audit in Antrim County. So what she was referring to is what she declared were um, what she said were these risk limiting audits throughout the state that she conducted. She stated uh, that she conducted a review of 16,044 ballots, oh, I'm sorry, 18,162 ballots randomly from 1,300 of the Michigan's 1,520 local election jurisdictions. Um, that's what she did. But we know that 16,044 of those ballots were from Antrim County. That means that what she did was she took a look at, she said in her risk limiting audit, she took a look at uh, an, uh, 2,118 ballots from 1,300 jurisdictions, which equates to about 1.63 ballots per jurisdiction. Under no uh, semblance of any type of definition, would that be considered an audit under 168.318? Why is that the case? Says who? Says the statute. The statute states specifically that the audit must include a review of documents, ballots, and procedures. That's the language within 168.318. So what aspect of that did not occur in this instance, in, she, your, in your opinion? In our opinion, she took a look at 1.63 ballots from 1,300 local jurisdictions. So, so what is the legal standard that establishes that that's insufficient? The legal standard is, is I think, simply it would be, well, 2.116C10. We have to take a look at what the issue is. It's an issue of fact, number one. What did she do when she says that she looked at 2,118 ballots from 1,300 jurisdictions under no under no definition can we say that she conducted an audit under two point under 168.31. That statute specifically says review the documents, ballots, and procedures. She didn't do that. She didn't review any documents in any of these jurisdictions. She didn't review any procedures in any of these jurisdictions. What she did was she looked at, uh, uh, as I said, 2,118 ballots in 1,300 jurisdictions amounting to 1.63 ballots per jurisdiction. And specifically, the statute states that the election audit must include a review of these. This is not limiting. This is not, oh, we, we, uh, we, we should maybe look at this stuff. This says you must, you must include this information. And that's why we say when we use the word include and when the constitution says liberally construed in favor of the voter, we have to understand and interpret that provision, I believe, to liberally state that we include everything that happened within the election. So what did we actually get to do in this case? We did get to take a forensic image of the Antrim County system. We did some testing of the computer systems, but the trial court never even examined any of that evidence in its determination. There was no review of any attached equipment we had no access to external modems. We had no access to ballot images or really ballots themselves. Indeed, during the hand recount on December 17, 2020, 
there were significant issues and people on the counting boards raised issues at that time regarding those ballots that they were looking at. Um, and we detailed that in our response to the motion for summary disposition, which we attached as appendix one, um, volume one, 166 to 168 are the pages. This clearly violated 168.31. We didn't get an audit of all of those items. Further, we only looked at the presidential election in Antrim County in the hand recount, which we know wasn't an audit, but throughout the rest of the state with these other 2,118 ballots, they only examined, we understand, the presidential election. They did not look at any down ballot races. So we cannot say that there was an audit of the statewide elections at all. Um, uh, in, in your view is, is that if there is an audit that a voter finds to be inadequate in their eyes, they would have a personal right to conduct their own audit and demand discovery. In a quo warranto proceeding, absolutely. A, a voter is permitted to come in to court, file a complaint and state uh, in their pleadings that they're entitled to an audit under um, section uh, 41H. Clearly gives them the right to all voters in the state, they have a right to conduct an audit of the statewide election. So just to follow up on Judge Cameron's question, uh, the Secretary of State in, their, in her briefing indicated that we have 8 million registered voters in this state. So I have the same question I know Judge Elsenheimer put to you. Does that mean that we might have 8 million audits of every election potentially? No, it's an, I, is it an individual right, first of all? That's my first question. Yes, it is an individual right. So we could, in fact, have 8 million audits of every election under that theory. Is that right? Theoretically, but it didn't. We could have 2,000 audits or 10,000. Is you, that? You absolutely could. You okay. could have as many audits as voters come forth in court, file a quo warranto, um, and say, under this constitutional provision, which is not limiting. Right. It simply says that the voter, all voters, have a right to conduct an audit of the statewide election. Now, let's think about that practically, okay. because it didn't happen. We know it didn't happen in the last election. There were only a few challenges. Um, in, this, in Antrim County, there was obviously only our challenge, one challenge by one voter who filed a quo warranto. Um, and he came in and said, I'm entitled to a audit under this provision. Now that's where the interplay comes in with 168.31a, because this section gives power to the Secretary of State uh, to prescribe the procedures under which that audit would occur. But I believe the most important sentence in that statute is the first sentence, uh, which says the Secretary of State shall prescribe the procedures for election audits and include reviewing the documents, ballots, and procedures. This is what the statute says. It's plain language. It's very clear to us what it, what it means. And you compare that and interact that with, with section 41H. Yes, uh, taxpayers or voters have the right to conduct an audit. I have one, one more follow-up question. And this is challenging because of course it's a new, new constitutional language and new statute. So we're trying to figure out what it all means. So the right to an audit, which clearly exists, what's the scope of that? I, and and what, what relief are you seeking? Is there a right to have an audit of the results in an individual county and only one county or a 10 counties? Or is it a right only to have an audit of all 83 counties? In other words, a statewide audit. So what's the scope of the right I guess, in geographic terms. Right, so the, 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 it's a great question. The statute says an audit of statewide elections. Um, we come in to Antrim County. Um, we uh, filed within our complaint, we demanded an audit of uh, the presidential election, which is a statewide election. Right. Um, uh, and we also raised within our pleadings other issues on down ballot races. But your relief was 
a, an audit of the statewide election limited to Antrim County. Is that my understanding that correctly? Uh, yes. You, you're seeking an audit of the results in Antrim yes, County. Yes, we're only. seeking an audit of, audit of the results in Antrim County okay. um, in terms of these elections. And we ask for relief as to down ballot uh, elections also, which, okay. which both myself and even Judge Elsenheimer's thought was uh, very important. Um, so, uh, as I said, we didn't even get any of the the procedures that we were looking for in this case. We weren't able to look at the ballots themselves, um, other than uh, through a counting board at a hand recount on December seventeenth. Um, but but my client and our experts were not able to inspect ballots. So what? What were the forensic images that he, um, in his initial order, permitted you to to take? Those were of what, if not the the ballots? But and so well, a, a forensic a forensic image is a an exact duplication of the Antrim County Election Management System. It's not okay. a copy. It's something more than that. It is a, it is an image that we can then. Uh, take back to our office, install on a laptop, mount that image, and run the system as if we're sitting in Antrim County. And we can see within that image uh, everything that's happened up to the date we take that image, including internet connections, security logs, other logs, deleted files, all things like that. But as we pointed out in one of the expert reports prepared by Ben Cotton, um, he stated there were a number of items that we were still missing. We he said we didn't get the image cast listener express server, the express firewalls, the managed switches, 17 external modems, uh, the communication manager server, uh, and so on and so forth. He listed a, a, a number of items that we never got that were vital to our audit of the Antrim County uh, election, which we believe we're entitled to under 168.31a because of the express language within that statute that gives us the right that says included is all these items, which we didn't have. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, in that respect, you, you have to think of, you know, what are we entitled to under the statute? Obviously, that's what you all are gonna have to decide. Um, and what did we actually get? What we got was very limiting um, in terms of what we needed to conduct an audit. Um, and so the trial court said it didn't have jurisdiction because the issues were moot. Said, hey, you know, Jocelyn Benson, the Secretary of State, gave you what you wanted, an audit. Uh, and that's where we think the case failed. Um, the decision failed because we didn't get an audit. We got what Jocelyn Benson determined in her mind on her own outside the bounds of 168.31a. Outside the, outside the bounds of section 4.1H, uh, um, she made up her own definition. Didn't the, well, didn't the statute commend that to her? Didn't the legislature give her that authority in the first sentence of the? Seemingly, right? That, it, that's how it looks to me. Well, so it, it, says, I, it, it, it says that she has, it's she, the Secretary of State shall prescribe procedures for election audits, right. including review of documents, ballots, okay. and procedures. So we're back. So I never did that. Yeah. That's the key Thank language you. that we have. Also, okay. the, next, the next sentence also says the Secretary of State and the county clerks shall conduct election audits. So it's clear they, they according to the statute, it would seem to me, my reading of it, they have, they're the only ones mentioned in the statute as having authority to conduct election audits. I know your position is that if, if the Secretary of State uh, audit is, in my eyes, inadequate or inconsistent with how I read the statute, I have a private individual right to conduct my own audit. And I, I think I agree with you on the mootness issue, but for me, this case turns on whether an individual voter has an individual right to conduct an audit when they view the Secretary of State's audit to be inadequate. That's where I see this case turn. Agreed, I agree with you. So let's take that, let's parse that out. The voter, we believe, has the right to conduct an audit as the voter sees fits under the Constitution. 
which is why um, we argue that 168.31a is unconstitutional in application and on its face because it limits the rights prescribed under section 41H. That constitutional amendment is clear. A voter has the right to conduct an audit of the statewide election. And it says specifically then that this right shall be expanded on or could be expanded on by the legislature, but not limited. We cannot limit those rights through legislation. That's what 168.31a does. It limits the right of the voter to conduct an audit of statewide elections because it hands that power to the Secretary of State and tells her she has the right essentially to do what she wants, define her own audit, come up with whatever she wants. So that's why 168.31a is unconstitutional. The Constitution says the elector has the right to have the results of statewide elections audited, not to audit elections. Isn't that a, an important distinction? It's written in the passive voice, in other words. So that suggests to me that it's a right to have someone else conduct an audit, not for me to conduct an audit. So do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I can certainly see how you would read it that way. We read it differently, but I, under, I, I understand that interpretation. But even if that's the interpretation and that's where you land, you still, we still have the right, right to have the results of the statewide election audited. Mm -hmm. um, and then 168 comes into play. In a says, legal manner. In a legal manner, on, as prescribed under 168.318, which includes right. all of these things that we never got, that okay. never actually happened. That's where the case failed. That's where the Secretary of State ultimately failed. She just went out and said, hey, look, I did audits. I did audits across the state. I looked at 1.6 ballots from uh, 1,300 jurisdictions, and that should satisfy everyone within the state. Well, it certainly didn't satisfy the plaintiff in this case, because he stands back and says, that's ridiculous. That's not an audit. Under any definition, she completely failed to do what she was required to do under 168.31a. She didn't include any of this other stuff that she was supposed to include. So getting back to your question where you're looking at the idea of um, what does this language mean? So if we land on the idea that, that a voter doesn't have the right himself to conduct an audit, but only has the right to have an audit conducted, then it has to be done within the framework of 168.31a. And what's most important is the first sentence, I believe, of that statute was amended, added into that statute after the constitutional amendment was passed. So the legislature came back, took a look at that amendment, modified their statute and said, we have to include additional language, which is this section that says, uh, um, uh, because to your point, the, the statute itself says, uh, I think you were saying that the, uh, the secretary of state and county clerks shall conduct election audits. So the legislature recognized that, understood that, but came back, amended the statute, added in the first sentence, and said she must uh, do these election audits in a way that include uh, review of documents, ballots, and procedures, which we never got. Uh, and that's, I think, where uh, the trial court failed when it dismissed the case under C4, saying you got what you asked for. Never got what we asked for because it didn't meet the, the standard. It didn't meet the express language in, in the, in the uh, statute. But even so, um, there were many other, I think, problems with dismissing our case under C4. I think we all can agree that even if the judge says uh, that the case is moot, um, that we still have an issue um, uh, under the mootness doc doctrine. Um, um, what, we, what we set forth in our briefing was that such claims are not moot because they fall within the capable of repetition yet evading review exception. And, and I, we have I, I should have asked you this earlier. Did you want to reserve five minutes for rebuttal? Or, yes, that's to, great. Because you're, you're, you're bumping up against that five minutes now. Okay. So. Yeah, five minutes. Okay. That'd be great. So the, then the only other thing I'd, I'd touch on right here would be the idea um, uh, that 
when, the, when Judge Eisenheimer dismissed the case under C4, what he did, he looked at those press releases submitted by the Secretary of State. That was essentially the evidence. That was what he took as evidence or her statement that she conducted these audits across the state because otherwise we had nothing. In Antrim County, no audit admitted to by uh, Secretary of State's uh, counsel. So Judge Elmas Elsenheimer basically saves the defendants in this case, says, look it, I'm looking at these press releases. They're clearly hearsay. There's no exception to the idea that these uh, can be admitted. Press releases um, are not reports. Um, that can be admitted. Uh, they, um, they do not describe a general activity uh, of the agency per se. They were specific to a certain instance, November 3rd, but even if there is an exception, they are self-serving. They are not trustworthy. Judge Elsenheimer should not have admitted those or considered them, which if he doesn't, if we don't consider those press releases as evidence, we come back to the idea in Antrim County, what did we have? Everyone knows we had a hand recount. Everyone understands and acknowledges there was no uh, audit done right. in Antrim County. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we got five minutes. Thank you. All right, Mr. Grill. Good morning, Douglas Curl on behalf of Antrim County. Uh, I don't want to regurgitate my brief and the court certainly doesn't want to hear that. It seems like the questioning today and the discussion is really boiled down to what the secretary of state did or didn't do or should or shouldn't have done. She has her own counsel here in the form of the attorney general to speak for her. Uh, so unless the court has any specific question with regard to Antrim County, I will defer to the attorney general. I don't, I don't. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, Your Honors. Morning. Assistant Attorney General Eric Grill on behalf of the intervening defendant appellee, Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. I'm joined at council table by Assistant Attorney General Heather Lancast. Uh, the appellant in this case attempts to raise many arguments uh, in their appeal, but this case really boils down to one question, and that is whether or not uh, Article 2, Section 41H of the Michigan Constitution provides an individual right. Uh, to an audit or open-ended audits of every aspect of state federal elections. And if the answer to that question is no, then every other claim in this case is moot because there's no relief that the plaintiff is entitled to. So with that in mind, I'll begin by asking the court if there's not, any question or something you'd like to Yeah, I, I'm not sure I agree with you uh, on the mootness issue. Um, it seems to me that the, the fact that it seems as though you're saying if the the answer to that question is no, then the rest of the, then the remainder of plaintiff claims are meritless. They have no validity. And so goes your argument. Therefore, they're moot. I don't know that the weakness of the, the claims or the lack of validity of their claims renders them moot. I, I, I think that the question is, is, is there something about the plaintiff's claims? Are they requesting something that was not granted? And it seems to me that that, that, that doesn't render the, the, the weakness or the lack of validity of claims do not render an issue moot. And in that respect, Ron, I think I agree with you. And I think if I may, I think there's a distinction in our arguments and the way we addressed it in the motion for summary disposition was basically a two tiered approach. Uh, and the first being, we're arguing that the case is moot because there is no additional relief that they are eligible to receive. And then if that did not work, our, our, the next argument was C8 grounds on each individual claim uh, and the merits thereof and the fact that there was no legal remedy, they were not entitled, they, their claims failed on the legal merits. So the argument as to mootness is simply what is the relief the plaintiff appellant is entitled to? Let me, let me just, uh, I mean, what are we, um, my sense is that this case turns on the very issue that you said at the beginning and I don't want you to burn a lot of your time talking about an issue that maybe we disagree on, but isn't going to be outcome determinative. So maybe you can just jump to the to the key issue in terms of the individual right that a voter has or doesn't have to conduct their own audits of a statewide election. And then I'll turn it over to my colleagues to figure out if, if they want to go back to the mootness issue. Fair enough, Your Honor. Uh, and so getting into the, the, the question itself, what does it mean when the Constitution says 
uh, that, the, that the voters have a right to have the results of statewide elections audited in a manner prescribed by law. Uh, usefully, uh, every case that has examined this question up until now has determined that the, that is not an individual right to conduct their own audits. That was the conclusion in the Costantino case and in the Janetsky case. So uh, it's helpful that these cases, whenever it has comes up, uh, have determined that that is not, uh, that the appellant's argument is incorrect. There is not that individual right. Now, I recognize that those, case, those decisions are not binding precedent in this case, but the consistency with which the previous courts have arrived at that conclusion is at least persuasive. But more importantly, and I think probably of greater interest, interest to this court, is the actual language of the Constitution itself. And the language of the Constitution does not support the appellant's claim. As this court well knows, constitutional provisions are interpreted according to the common understanding of the people at the time that they were ratified. Uh, but plan, applying the plain, and the, excuse me, a common understanding of the provisions here simply does not support the idea of an individual right. No one voting for this amendment would have thought that the proposal would result in 8 million individual audits throughout the state of Michigan. Uh, that would not ensure the accuracy and integrity of elections, it would undermine it. Uh, perpetual audits would mean that no election results would ever be final. No election would ever be certain. We would do these audits perpetually throughout any officer's term, and there would always be room for doubt as to what the outcome of the election was. But more importantly, look at the language itself. What does it say? It does not say an individual may conduct their own audits. If that had been the uh, intent of the framers, they could have said so. The rest of the rights, you know, A through F, and G all include the right of, this is the right of the voter to do X. They could have just said to conduct your audit, to audit the result, to audit elections in Michigan. <clears throat> what the language instead says is to have the results of statewide elections audited in a manner prescribed by law. First, we're talking about results. It's not, the constitution does not require an audit of processes or equipment or the source code of machines. It requires an audit of the results. The count is the count correct. The next part of the, the next part of the language is to have the results audited. If you're talking to someone and you're saying, "I'm going to have my house painted," you're not the one painting your house. The use of the language here to have the audit conducted suggests that this, there is some remove between the individual voter and the audit being conducted. And what's important is that this is consistent with other language in Article One, Section Four, One. Uh, excuse me, Article 2, Section 4.1. In Article 2, Section, in, excuse me, in Section 4.1b, there is a similar use of the invocation of to have your absent, if you're a military or overseas voter, you have the right to have an application sent to you. Let me interrupt you for a minute. You said a moment ago that the key issue is, is the count correct? That's all that the Secretary of State is, is, is able to do. Are, are you saying the Secretary of State couldn't do a deeper dive? Well, no, or, or our future Secret Secretary of State couldn't do a deeper dive into the data? No, Your Honor. And the, all I'm referring to at this point is simply the language of the Constitution. What the Constitution requires is a result, uh, is an audit of the statewide results. Section uh, MCL 16831A goes beyond that and says, well, we're going to have the Secretary of State look at the processes and the documents. And the actual audit the Secretary of State conducted in this case was the most extensive audit that has ever been conducted in the state's history. The Secretary of State examined 200 paper ballot uh, precincts. The Secretary of State uh, audit also included a review of the absent voter counting board audits. And it further engaged in a number of risk limiting audits. Uh, approximately 18,000 ballots were randomly selected for more than 1,300 local jurisdictions. And the results of those randomly selected ballots were compared against the statewide tag. It did include those things required by the statute, because I think that's Mr. DiPerno's stronger argument that the audit that was conducted was uh, too skimpy, if you will, and did not include the things that the statute says must be included. Did it or did it not? It did. I mean, I, I'm cautious here of engaging into too much of a factual foray, but for the record, the Secretary of State's audit was included in the uh, Antrim County appendix. It's a 41 page document that summarizes the Secretary's uh, audit. And it's fairly extensive and it addresses exactly the process, the documents, the things that the, stat that the statute requires. I would also like to point out that if uh, the plaintiff appellant is dissatisfied or believes that the Secretary of State did not perform her statutory duty under 31A, the remedy for that is mandamus. 
to simply go to the court and say the secretary hasn't done her duty. She needs to go back and do a better audit. That's the remedy, not conducting his own audit, for which there is no support either in the Constitution or in the statute. Uh, I'd also like to point out that the point Mr. DiPerno made a moment ago about that the 18,000 ballots includes the 16,000 hand count ballots. That's nowhere in the record. And honestly, I'm not sure where that's coming from. Uh, where it's mentioned in his brief, it refers to the appellant's uh, ASOG uh, expert report, which doesn't say that either. It just identifies that 16,000 ballots in Antrim County were part of the were, were part of the, uh, the, rec of the, the votes in that county. Uh, to be clear, the 18,000 randomly selected ballots and, these, and the hand count of the presidential results in Antrim County are two separate things. So there were both of them in this case. Uh, I also want to emphasize a point here. The Constitution 41H expressly calls to at, um, the manner of the audits being as prescribed by law. The plaintiff's the plaintiff appellant's argument is fairly ambiguous about what they think as prescribed by law means. Uh, we think it means exactly what it says, that you have the right to have an audit performed in the manner prescribed by law, prescribed by the legislature. The entirety of the appellant's argument goes on to the follow-up paragraph that says these rights are self-executing. But I think it's important to note that the Constitution says that these rights are self-executing. That paragraph refers to the entire batch of one through of A through H. It's not a specific call out to the audit. What is specific is, one A, is 41H specifically calling out to legislative enactment, calling out to the manner of the audit being that prescribed by law. And as a general point of constitutional interpretation, the specific provision controls over the general. Yeah, that, Your Honor, again, I think the, the language of the Constitution itself makes clear that this is not an individual right to perform your own audit. Uh, when you're looking at the language of 41B that talks about having the, uh, abs the military overseas ballots uh, you know, to have an application sent to them, it says to have the application sent. It certainly doesn't contemplate the military or overseas voter sending them themselves their own application. It clearly contemplates that being the work of an election official. So too, when we look at section 401H, when we're talking about having an audit performed, it clearly contemplates that being done by an election official. In this case, the legislature has determined that to be the secretary of state. And that makes sense. The secretary of state is the elected uh, official responsible for holding elections. She has been entrusted not just by the legislature, but by the people themselves when they elected the Secretary of State to that position. The, the audit that was conducted was a statewide audit then, correct? Correct. Um, so I'll ask you the same question I put to Mr. DiPerno. Is there a right to have an a constitutional right to have an audit conducted of the results of a statewide election in an individual county or counties? That's less than statewide. The language of the constitution calls for an audit of the results of statewide elections. I, I think even any way you look at that, it's a it's a audit of the statewide election results. I don't see how you get okay. that to an individual county. Okay. And I think it's important to note that that's exactly what the secretary of state's audit actually was, was a, can, was a audit of the entire state. And part of what they did in reviewing the, uh, the precincts of the 200 in-person voting precincts was to examine the it included a full hand count of paper ballots cast in the U.S. Senate race and then comparing those against the actual tabulated results. Uh, so that's exactly what the Secretary of State did. Uh, and again, even if she didn't, the remedy for that is to make her do it, not to do it, not to do it himself. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Judge Kavanaugh, any questions? All set. Thank you. No? No? No. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Mr. Brown, you have five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I think what uh, what we what we learn here from uh, Brother Council's argument is um, he's saying that uh, what he's saying is that this is limited to is the count correct? Uh, that is just absolutely not the issue here. Uh, the issue um, that would that would mean we just simply look. We just run the paper ballots through the machines again. We just do a hand recount, as they say. That is not what 168.31a calls for. Um, I don't think our argument is ambiguous at all in terms of 
section 41H and 168.31. I think we clearly outlined that there is a clear interplay between those. The constitutional amendment says the voter has a right to have this, uh, an audit of the statewide elections as prescribed by law. We then jump to 168.31, which clearly states what she has to do. It must include um, these additional items. It must include procedures. Uh, Mr. Grill said that this does not allow for audit of procedures. That is just not correct. It must allow for an audit of the procedures. Secretary of State Benson must go back. This case must be remanded back to the trial court. Uh, the Secretary of State must be ordered to conduct an audit of the statewide elections as prescribed by law, which includes so many additional items and things that she never did. Uh, Mr. Grill also said uh, that this was the most extensive audit in history. Um, and, he said, and he said that she conducted an audit of uh, uh, the entire state, which we know is not true because she only did 1,300 local election jurisdictions. She didn't do the entire state. She did a very narrow, what we call risk limited audit, where she did a certain inspection of some ballots in some precincts, uh, very limited, not the entire state. Um, and uh, then Mr. Grill um, took exception to the idea that I say that of those 18,000 ballots that uh, 16,044 come from uh, Antrim County. That is clearly an issue of fact that we never got to in this case. Um, it is not an issue that can be cited, decided under C4 or C8, uh, but most importantly, Judge Elsenheimer dismissed the case under C4, under the mootness doctrine, which was an error. And the court, the, ca the case must be remanded back right. to uh, Judge Elsenheimer on the issue um, of actually the, deciding the motion on C8, which he never right. did. All right. All right. The judge, I'm sorry, the judge Kavanaugh. Have, Judge Kavanaugh, do you have a question? No, no, no. I, it, he just answered it. Thank you. Okay, great. I did that without even hearing. <laughs> without it, so. even knowing. That's right. That's right. Good Mental telepathy. That. So, no, thank you very much for your consideration. You. I appreciate it. And I appreciate being back in court. So do we. Live. Again. <laughs> it's such a refreshing feeling. So thank you so, very much. All right. Have a nice day. All right. Thank you both. Uh, matter is submitted. Nicely done by both sides. Thank We've got you. a number of people, maybe even some media in the courtroom. I'm going to give them an opportunity to leave the courtroom before we call the next case. In fact, I have to step out just for a moment to grab something I had left. All right, I think we're ready to call the next case. Item one on the docket, People of the State of Michigan versus Seth Horton, 359012. Consolidated, there's another docket ah, Which has been consolidated with 359218, thank you. These are both remote, I believe. Right. Good morning, Your Honors. Attorney Scott Graham on behalf of the defendant appellate, Seth Horton. I'll begin when at your cue. All right, we're ready for you. Um, we can hear you. Uh, I can't see you yet. I'm not sure that that... I think you need to start your video, Mr. Graham. Oh, I, I very much apologize. I'm doing that. Oh, let me try. Right there, I apologize. Thank okay. you. Not yeah. a problem. Okay, go right ahead. Obviously, I appreciate the court hearing this matter. Um, as a practicing attorney for 25 years, um, sexual assault trials are probably the most difficult cases to defend in the criminal justice system. As this court is well aware, they're typically one-on-one, -on -one, he said, she said, credibility contest where any improper observation of the defendant by a juror poses a significant danger of corruption of the fact-finding process. The prejudice may only be subtle and the juries, the jurors may not even be conscious of its significant impact, but in a system where every defendant is presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, 
due process and MRE 403 forbids toleration of that risk. Obviously, I'm asking this court to extend the protections of our United States Supreme Court and Estelle versus Williams or exclude the video in this case under MRE 403, obviously of the defendant being in jail garb at a preliminary exam in open court while the alleged victim is testifying in a highly emotional charged state. The context of where this video took place matters critically in deciding this issue. The video at the preliminary exam panned over the defendant wearing jail clothing or jail garb dozens of times. It might even have been almost 100 times. Uh, I guess when sound got picked up from the defense table, obviously the video automatically panned to the defendant. You know, that's what I believe triggered it. This would be the only time the jury would potentially see the alleged victim and they would be reminded over over and over again while they listen to the sobbing, emotional, alleged victim of the defendant, Seth Horton, wearing jail garb in a court of law. The question is, I would ask this panel to think, what inferences would a reasonable juror conclude? He is in jail, in jail garb. Certainly one inference, in my opinion, would be he's a dangerous person. Simply giving a curative instruction falls immeasurably to remove the immeasurably short of this impermissible stench, in my opinion. I have a question. Why is it that showing a defendant at a preliminary examination as the camera pans over a couple of times in jail garb, more prejudicial than say, what's routinely admitted uh, in criminal cases, say, at a interrogation. It's not unusual to have someone who is in custody, in fact, in handcuffs, and have that video introduced to trial. Or uh, it's not unusual to have uh, a phone conversation that takes place with a in-custody defendant with somebody outside of custody, uh, where it's obvious that that, that that person, when making the call, is in custody. Why isn't why is what happened at the preliminary examination worse than what happens at say an interrogation or a phone call in jail? Well, I think that's a fair question. I think the key distinction in that point is I think we've all seen shows on TV, Law and Order, and, and other shows where it's typically customary if there's some type of jailhouse interview, people are accustomed that an individual may be in jail. But I think when you see a person in an open courtroom. I think it's a different distinction that this person can't even be in court, you know, in jail garb that he must be dangerous. I think it has a different air than if a person is being interviewed by the police, which I think is customary. I think there's just objective distinction that a jury would view it differently. I think we are very common to see somebody being interviewed by the police in a jail setting. I think it's very, very normal. And I know I cited Thompson, which was out of state. They agreed with me. That was a, again, I understand it's not in this jurisdiction, although it was reversed on harmless era. They agreed that it still had an impermissible, that court agreed that it was still problematic. I think just factually, it should be distinguished. I don't think it's the same. And I think it is a different view by the jury. You, you're not used to seeing at least in front of a jury setting, a video of somebody in a open courtroom next to their attorney, especially juxtaposed with the victim going back and forth, a crying victim. I think that creates a different image. It might even be subconscious. It might be subtle, but I think that has to be factored in. Perhaps if it was just in court and it wasn't juxtaposed with, with a crying, the crying accuser, then perhaps the prejudice might be less than a jail interview with a detective. So I Mr. think- Mr. Grable, what about the fact though, and, and doesn't this have to be added into the balance that the defendant, while this video is being played, is presumably sitting in the courtroom, not in jail garb in front of the jury. So that, it seems to me, would at least, at least lessen the taint of the video, would it not? Well, it would, I think you would be correct if the, if the victim was, the alleged victim was testifying live, I think then the defendant, Mr. Horton would have the ability to, let's say, confront the victim on equal footing, clothed in civilian. 
Well, we wouldn't be here if that were the case. Well, I mean, I, I, we, I, I, we're talking about a historic video that was taken um, at the preliminary examination and being played for the benefit of a jury while the defendant sits in the courtroom in front of that jury, not in jail guard. So how does all of that factor into the mix here? Because what the jury has to consider is not just, hey, look at that guy. He's wearing an orange jumpsuit there at the preliminary examination. That's not the end of it because that same person is sitting right in front of them physically, not in an orange jumpsuit. So how does all this factor together? Well, I think, again, I think it's it's not the orange jumpsuit to be considered singularly as the only salient in fact. I think when when you look at the video, perhaps even subconsciously, you you have to juxtapose it with. I still think it creates an impermissible risk because even though he's there, the victim's not there. And that, again, may the, the prejudice of this may be affected, depending how the court rules on the secondary issue of whether the jury is exposed to her knowing that she passed away. But I don't think, as I said, especially with Zoom as well, people are so now accustomed because Zoom is so ubiquitous. I still think the I still think it creates at least subconsciously or subtly with a juror that they still assume he must have been in that courtroom because he was dangerous in jail garb that he was incarcerated. Um, I still think it is different than being in a jailhouse interview, which I think everybody, the average juror has been exposed to. I don't think the fact that he shows up at trial now wearing civilian clothes that removes that prejudice. The prosecutor does have other options here. If this was an all or nothing proposition, you know, weighing it, let's say the court was not willing to extend Estelle to say this is a due process violation. The court could certainly find under these unique facts that it violates 403 in analyzing 403. The court certainly has the ability to say, well, the prosecutor could have a transcript. They could play the audio. And perhaps if the if the video just showed the defendant one time, but it's over and over again, it might even be subconscious. The court, a juror might not even perceive it as being problematic. But I think the cases on this issue indicated it might just be some type of subconscious. So, Mr. Graham. You know, so yes. I, I think I think you've really hammered home the jail garb issue. Is there okay. any other issues you want to cover? Well, I guess there were some other things. I, I was going to say why the prosecutor wants to play the video as opposed to obviously not just, you know, not, you know, not just put the video in. I would just say again, and I apologize for being circuitous. But I believe the defendant deserves the right to be brought before the court with the appearance of dignity and self-respect of a free or innocent man. Now, certainly this panel say, I don't think this erodes that. Obviously, courts have taken the Thompson court would, again, I realize it's in Florida, would, differ, would disagree with you on that particular thing. I certainly respect the court. But again, I would ask the court to understand that the jail garb, when it's shown, has to be it's simultaneously why the alleged victim testifies. That's an important facet of this. Um, and again, I think if the jury gets exposed to the reason, um, you know, of why the victim's not there, I think it further exacerbates this prejudice. I can certainly go into the distinctions also, and I, I won't belabor the point of, I, again, the, the unpublished opinion of People v. Finch. Yeah, I don't I don't think that's going to no. be. OK, then I won't I won't go into it. Only I want the court to know the defendant did request at the preliminary exam that he was not going to be in jail. garb. He did request that and that request was denied. The only thing I'll mention is the Finch court did indicate that was a factor in the analysis. That's all I'll say about the Finch court, but they did state that. that I'm, should, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Your Honors. I apologize. I'm, I'm going to move on before I get flogged of the jail garb issue. I appreciate you indulging me. Um, unless the court has any questions, I, I, I believe I'm the only one endorsed on that. I'll move on to the death issue with the with the courts, uh, unless the court has any questions. If I have questions. no questions at no. all. No questions. Thank you. On anything. Okay. I appreciate it. And I will not bring up the word jail garb again. I promise. <laughs> you just, you just did it. <laughs> uh, 
I stand mute on that. Moving on to the death issue, which again, I think is, is certainly more, I don't want to say more problematic, but, but unusual. Um, as the court aware, the committee that promulgates the standard jury instructions, including witness unavailability, we're certainly aware and mindful that witnesses could be unavailable for a multitude of reasons. Death, illness, absconding, fear are some of the things that come to mind. I'm sure the court could figure out other reasons. Yet, in 25 years of practice as a, as a seasoned trial attorney, I've never seen a jury, a, you know, a jury giving a special instruction or being or offer evidence of why a witness is unavailable. Here, the prosecution wants to offer testimony through the grieving mother of the alleged victim in a CSC first capital case. If Could you imagine if the alleged victim, and, and it did not happen in this case, obviously, but hypothetically speaking, if the alleged victim absconded in this case, does this panel believe that the prosecutor under these circumstances would allow me to ask for a special instruction or offer evidence that the witness absconded, assuming the case went to trial, I think we all know the answer. Well, don't, Obviously, don't, don't you think that if this was a domestic violence case and the victim was, or the complaining witness was unavailable uh, because she recanted or she didn't want to prosecute, uh, don't you think any any and every defense attorney would 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 be demanding that that go in front of the jury because oh. I mean that that certainly is it's, it's relevant and it's not in this law under 403 what this is a case of a woman who died in a car accident unrelated to the crime why why isn't it admissible well why I think it's not admissible is because number one in a CSC case could you again let's say the grieving mother gets on there respectfully so because this is absolutely tragic nobody in their right mind should not feel a sense of sadness and empathy for the entire family. But to think that based on that, they're going to hear this and then understand, as the court is aware, cross-examination is going to be to discredit the woman who is now deceased, who is 20 years old, and think that the jury is not going to want to kill me and then we'll take great pleasure in punishing the defendant for speaking ill of the dead. I feel uncomfortable making this argument now to you, and I'm prefacing everything with apologies to suggest that a juror can separate that tragedy and then suddenly say, we're going to give you every benefit of presumption of innocence and all due respect is absurd. I think I've never heard of, uh, no, I don't think a jury would let in if she absconded. I think the case would maybe dismissed, but no, I've never seen a case where a witness absconded or was reluctant. I've seen domestic assault cases go forward without the victim showing up. There's, he there's, there's exceptions to hearsay that they'll let the police testify. No, I would disagree. I, I, don't, I don't see that getting in in front of many judges, in my opinion. And you know, I think the reasons that the prosecutor provided of why they need the mother to testify, the reasons are so critical, frankly, is a subterfuge. I, I, I don't think that the jury is going to assume why she's not there is because she doesn't want to testify or subject herself to cross-examination. Why then would there not, why does the unavailability, unavailability instruction not have some proviso for death or sickness or illness? There's a good reason why not. The standard instruction is sufficient. And the only thing I'll say, um, I certainly have trust in the jury system. So let me make that clear. I don't want to disparage the jury system that they can't separate fact from fiction. But please understand, we're talking about the same jury that the same jury system that acquitted OJ, but yet convicted the innocent Reuben Hurricane Carter. All right, Mr. Gray, I think I feel like we're 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 yeah. way past a detour on this. Why don't we do this? Why don't Why don't you reserve the what time you have left? I will, and, th Thank and then you. we'll hear from the prosecution. Thank you. All right, Sadler. Thank you. Uh, now, just just to be clear, uh, I'm sorry. Could you could you put your appearance on the record first, please? Yes. Uh, Jillian Sadler, uh, P77564, uh, Chief okay. Assistant Prosecuting Attorney for Chippewa County for the appellee. Thank you. You're endorsed on one, not both of the files. Yes. Uh, why, why don't you reserve, why don't you stick to that file and you can proceed. 
Thank you. I will not be speaking as to the um, the video, but rather just the um, the issue of the victim's death and whether or not that should be admitted. All right, go ahead. Thank you. The um, at the outset, I think it's important that the court know that the mother will be testifying. She is the uh, individual who picked up the victim the day after the event, approximately four hours after uh, the assault allegedly took place, and she's the one who transported the victim to the hospital for the sexual assault kit. Uh, she is also the one who had seen uh, the victim in the years following that, and so would be able to testify as to the change in demeanor and to the severe psychological effects that this had on her daughter. The issue that we have with never mentioning that her daughter is dead is twofold. First off, this is a he said, she said, in which she can say nothing. She has absolutely no ability to speak to the jury at all, no ability to rebut anything that is brought up on cross-examination. Um, we are limited entirely to what was brought up on, um, at the preliminary examination. And um, so I think as we look at people v. Gee, when you're looking at a credibility contest, I think it's very important that the jury know that this victim would be here, would be telling them what it is that happened to her if she could. And in this time of ubiquitous Zoom, as defense has indicated, it's illogical to think that somebody who cares about a prosecution, about being sexually assaulted, would not show up either via Zoom or in person to both tell their story as well as to rebut the many slanders against them. It so just I think you've got a good argument why it's relevant. Why is it, uh, it seems like defense is focusing appropriately so on whether it's unfairly prejudicial under 403. Why don't you address that issue? So 403 looks at whether or not it is substantially more prejudicial than probative. And I think that, and we're looking at a credibility contest first and foremost. So I think the reason why she's not there is highly probative. It's um, very relevant that the jury know that it's not possible for her to be here as she's being attacked. Um, as far as the probative value goes, there's a jury instruction that's directly on point that asks how long the mental anguish lasted. That's one of the elements of this case. Um, and defense has indicated in their rebuttal uh, or reply brief that they are not conceding the mental anguish section. So in order for the people to bring forth this evidence of how long did the um, injury last pursuant to the jury instruction, the correct answer is that it lasted for the rest of her life. And that's extremely probative. To say that it lasted for two years and then suddenly ended is misleading to the jury. And that's not the point of 403. I don't feel that it's overly prejudicial that they find out that the reason that she's not there is because she was killed in a traffic accident. I don't think that it somehow um, in any way implies that the defendant did anything wrong. However, I think it is important too for the court to know that part of the evidence that prosecution will be presenting is a series of Snapchat videos in which the defendant threatens or makes comments about killing the victim and wanting to put her in the ground. So I think it's important that for a prejudicial standpoint that the jury hear that she was killed in a traffic accident, that it has nothing to do with the defendant, that it can in no way be imputed to him. I think that that actually um, falls on the side of prosecution as well, that they know that- where, where, Where's the evidence of the Snapchat? Is that, is that your, I mean, is that in the record anywhere? It is, it's been heavily litigated. Um, we've actually had two separate motion hearings on it, evidentiary hearings and it's been um, ruled that those are coming in. There's, I think, six different videos that um, were presented and made part of the record in circuit court, yes. All right, is there anything else? Um, only that when witnesses are asked to ignore critical pieces of information, especially when we're talking about lay witnesses, not police officers who are on the stand more often than most, it causes a very stilted way of testifying if they are trying to avoid certain tenses or certain ways, um, if they're trying to essentially hide information, it looks like they're trying to hide information. This is something that the jury will see, they pick up on it. Um, and I don't see that there's any way that we can ask the grieving mother to change her tense into, I guess the present perfect tense or the past perfect tense was suggested by uh, defense in order to avoid the um, imp implying that Katie is no longer with us or that the victim is deceased. Uh, so I think that having this um, kept out from the trial itself is actually going to set us up for a few issues. But one of the biggest issues is that it will look like um, different witnesses are being untruthful when they are in fact being truthful, but they're trying to trip over their speech in order to avoid 
mentioning that Katie has now passed. Thank you. Okay. Any I'm sorry. Any questions, Judge Kavanaugh? I'll say. I'll say. No, Thank you. No. All right. You're welcome. Um, any rebuttal? Just briefly, I mean, I, since the prosecutor brought in some facts, so assuming the mother testifies and she can't testify, obviously on emotional state or mental anguish, which I don't think is problematic, I think that could easily be established. She could say she had three nightmares and that would probably satisfy the element. But just to give you an offer of proof, because I think you have to analyze it, which has been offered in the lower record and litigated, the alleged victim in the case had sex with somebody else at the party. I mentioned that because obviously after they find out she's dead and I offer the fact, which by the way, was ruled admissible that she had sex with somebody at the party that was consensual. It's part of our defense theory, why she purportedly fabricated this. Then she did get picked up her mother, uh, by her mother and she spent the night with another man who was her pseudo boyfriend that night. And I offer that Imagine the jury after hearing that, how insensitive that's going to look, which is going to be admissible. The court has already ruled it admissible. I don't see how after attacking the victim multiple times and then knowing she died in an accident, how that's not going to have some impact on her. And it, the prosecution makes it like it's a tactical advantage that the victim's not going to be there. The alleged victim's not going to be there at trial. As this court knows, the cross-examination of the prelim is much different than a cross-examination at a trial. Usually it's a soft cross. You're just, you may hold some things back to save for trial. Here, that's the defendant isn't going to get the opportunity to fully cross-examine the alleged victim. I'm certainly not, I'm certainly not holding that against the prosecutor, but to suggest that's some tactical advantage because she's not there is ridiculous as anything. I think it's a disadvantage. All right. So All right. I don't let me let me do something a little unusual. I, I'm gonna one question for Ms. Sadler and I want you to respond to this. Ms. Sadler, is is it couldn't in terms of how the jury will hear that the complaining witness is now deceased, would you agree with me that the trial court could notify the jury after it's been impaneled, as opposed to a grieving mother disclose that information to the jury? Would you agree with me that that is one way to do it? That's perfectly fine. I, I was had no intention of going into depth on, on her death with the so mother. From your, from your perspective, in terms of how the jury learns that the complaining witness is now deceased, that is something that you would anticipate the trial court advising the jury as opposed to a family member who would understandably be emotional about disclosing that information. Would you agree with me that the trial court could and sounds like will be doing that before the trial court? Is that correct? Before the jury? That if this court thinks that that's the best way to do it, we will absolutely do it that way. My intent uh, it's, was it's not going to be part of the office. opinion, but I mean, if, if you're concerned about an appellate issue, that's the best way to do it. That's absolutely fine. All I want is agreeable. Is would that be agreeable? I mean, you understand that 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 would be something that you could request. You agree with that, right? Well, I agree. I could request it. I don't think it would cure my concerns, but yeah, I, sure. I, I would request it, but no, I respectfully would, would do anything I have to do. Yeah. I believe I would have the ability to request it, but I don't want to misrepresent to the court that I would find that acceptable remedy at I understand. all, I understand. I, but I appreciate the court asking the question. Okay. All right. Uh, Judge Kavanaugh, any questions? All set. No, no. All right. I think we're all set. Thank you both very much. Well argued. Uh, the matter is submitted. Thank, Thank you for you. the court's time. You're Thank welcome. you. Turning now to the next case, item two, people of the state of Michigan versus Noah Yates, 354180. Morning. Good morning, Your Honors. Mike Middlestad of the State Appellate Defender's Office, appearing on behalf of Mr. Yatz. I See, think that's Yatz. How, I yes. believe that's how it's right. pronounced. Yes. Name. Uh, with us today, maybe they can confirm, is uh, Mr. Yatz's parents. Uh, Thank you for letting us know. Yatz. Thank you for letting us know. Yes. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I need to reserve any time for rebuttal. I don't think I'll take uh, anywhere near 30 minutes, but in just case I, I, I do go that far, I'll reserve five minutes or okay. whatever time I have. Okay. 
So, um, there's three issues raised in the brief. I intend to devote the most of my comments on the first issue, um, a few comments on the second issue, and the, unless the panel has any questions, and then a few more on the third issue there, if that makes any sense to you. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, with regard to the first issue, we call it the Thorpe issue uh, in the vernacular. Um, whether a statistical or a numerical value was placed on an expert's opinion in this field um, is not really relevant. What is relevant is that the jury heard, heard that it is very rare and extremely rare for a sexual assault complainant in this demographic to falsely report abuse. And that's what occurred here. The impact is the same as if uh, what happened as if it was uh, what happened in Thorpe where the person put a uh, percentage on it. And in the, uh, I think it's the Jensen case that I mentioned in my, uh, in our brief there, it's attached as appendix B there. The impact is the same. The jury hears from a, from a qualified expert who is, has expertise in the field of how sexual assault complainants uh, deal with of being sexually assaulted, how sexual assault complainants make accusations, and how sexual assault complainants deal with the aftermath of it in terms of whether it's been delayed, whether it's been uh, recantations and whatnot. They have heard um, that it is very rare and extremely rare that this complainant, um, complainants in general, and this complainant specifically, uh, would have made a false statement. And Mr. Middle said this case is different from Thorpe, is it not? As you indicate, it wasn't expected wasn't extremely rare, wasn't the verbiage used, as I understand it. Yeah. There was a reference by the expert witness, um, which included the statement, very rare. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so Thorpe, I think, is, is qualitatively different in that uh, the expert in that case attached percentages to this and led the jury to almost an inescapable conclusion that there was no way that this witness, this victim complaining witness, uh, I'll put it that way, uh, was lying. So this case doesn't go, go that far. I, I think, is it fair to say you're seeking an extension of the rule in Thorpe? No, I think this is a logical extension of Thorpe. I think this is why it's plain error. Uh, Thorpe stands for the proposition that you can't, you can't place a probability on a victim line or a complainant line. You just can't. And there's no, I think there's no distinctions. It's distinction without a really a difference in this case. They're still looking for guidance as to who to believe. You know, these are very difficult uh, questions for the jury to answer. They, it's a very serious allegation. They don't want to put the defendant in jail. It's, uh, they don't want a sex offender to go free. They don't know what to do. It's a one witness case. And when they're assured by an expert that um, it's very rare that this person would lie. It's the same as putting a statistical number on it. So and if it's very, if very rare is the same as putting a statistical number on it, would rare be the same? Instead of saying I think so. very rare. So, yeah, so whether so. it's specific probability or very rare or rare or infrequent, right? I mean, I, we're struggling with yeah they, they, yeah, they just can't really go there. It's, I, it's it's you just can't go there you you cannot go okay. there um in terms of whether it's a number or whether it's a lot whether it's a little the defense expert wouldn't be able to say it's common for false accusations to make it's relatively common it's very common they would not be able to do that that's just not that's invading the province of the jury and it's particularly harmful in this case um a couple of things she said it twice she said it twice in a non-responsive manner. First, she was asked about the importance of a forensic interview as opposed to a parent's doing the questioning. And um, she said, well, forensics, you know, it's fine, but it's more about traumatizing the complainant than it is about getting false answers. In fact, it's pretty rare that they falsely report sexual abuse to their parents. So she said that. And then a couple of sentences later, again, in a non-responsive manner, she said it's very rare in general. So she said sexual assault complainants very rarely falsely report to their parents, and then she said, "In general, it's very rare." Okay, um, so Thank I think that's that. that's the that, that is why this is uh, particularly damaging because she did it twice, and there's no meaningful distinction between attaching a, new, a numerical mm. scale. Now, when you look at the prejudice of it, there is sort of a sliding scale, right? You look at the importance of the the credibility in the mix uh, to all the other issues there, and. Unlike Thorpe and unlike the Jensen case that I cited in my brief, this really is a one witness case. This is one witness. There's no physical evidence. There's no um, inculpatory statements. There's no other witnesses who saw anything shady going on. This is one witness and the jury is looking to her to see whether she's telling the truth. They don't want to they don't want to put somebody who's innocent in prison 
they're looking for a reassurance for a person with expertise in the field. And when they're told that it's probably, it's probably a very small possibility that this complainant is lying to you, um, that is gonna be the difference maker in this case. And you, you've got a, 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 overall, you've got a situation where this was a very tenuous uh, case. She made multiple um, inconsistent statements. She recanted her testimony. She falsely accused, she admitted she falsely accused somebody else of, of uh, in her first forensic interview of sexually molesting her, another boyfriend of her mother's. These are all things that the juror, jury could have hung their hat on in deciding that Mr. Yetz was not guilty. But when they get a, a, a reassurance from an expert, not once, but twice, that she probably was telling the truth, that the chances that she was lying to them were minuscule, that's the difference maker. Okay. If the court has any questions about that issue, I will move on to the second one. And I said, I. I Promised you brief brevity there. Um, the issue of the cutting, the the, uh, the testimony about Mr. Uh, Yats cutting himself. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, you know that the first issue is, of course, like, yeah, of course. I mean, you, you can cover the next two, but the first one is where right. your uh, case is going to rise or fall. Uh, of course, of course. But I just want to say briefly in response to uh, Sister Counsel, she said that the evidence already came in through the letters that were admitted. That's true, but those that was a passing reference in the letters, and the letters were sort of distance the, the complainant kind of distanced herself from the letters in her testimony she said you know that was just me being a dork that was me just being uh musing she really downplayed the significance and the truth of what was in the letter so really the damage was the testimony and that was my point i, I understand i will definitely move on and, and, and to the third issue and that's the issue of predatory conduct and i just will say briefly we have testimony in the abstract about what grooming behavior is in general from holly rosen again this expert uh, but we don't really have anything um, from the testimony itself about what Mr. Yatz did in terms of to match up with the group. All we have really is him being basically a parental figure in this family. Um, we got him doing things with all the kids together, individual kids, um, this complainant herself. There's no evidence really that he was doing anything that would fit the check off the boxes of grooming behavior. We don't really have him befriending her, isolating her, or doing anything to make her feel special beyond the other children or anything like that. Now, the two cases, Houston and um, Cannon, I think in my brief, talk about, um, you know, crimes of opportunity don't just don't make you a predator in terms of uh, the, the scoring of OB-10. There has to be pre-offense conduct for the primary purpose of, of victimization. We don't have evidence of this here. We just have Mr. Yatz Again, being the leader of a household or being a parental figure, doing things, doing normal activities, we don't have any evidence that there was actual room in here. Mm -hmm. So with that, I would reserve the remainder of my time for rebuttal and um, ask that you reverse Mr. Yatz's convictions. All right, thank, thank you. you. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Autumn Gruss on behalf of the people of the state of Michigan. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's important to note out that not only is this case qualitatively different, as you pointed out, Judge Godola, but the fact of the matter is that this, the um, um, Holly Rosen's testimony came out on cross-examination, not on direct exam. It was not the prosecution that brought this out. And the defense counsel multiple times, even before the very rare came out, asked her about research and if she discovered anything regarding children lying. And she responded, well, people in general, but not necessarily specifically to children. Um, he's like, well, is it possible? She says anything's possible. And he's like, okay, well, have you been exposed to research about why alleged victims may say something occurred when it didn't? Um, and she then, you know, talks about people feeling forced to put in the details. So while counsel claims that her answer of it being very rare was non-responsive, when you look at trial counsel's questioning in general, it was very responsive to what he was asking. He was asking, do children lie? And she basically says, well, it, it's very rare. Well, appellants also raising an ineffective assistance claim with respect to this issue. So where does this get you really? Well, so part of it is that he's not saying he was ineffective for asking the questions. He's ineffective for not objecting to her non-responsive answers. But they're not saying, well, he shouldn't have asked these other questions to begin with. That's where it's kind of a convoluted argument because you're not saying he shouldn't have asked her about the children lying in general. You're just saying he should have objected to these being non-responsive and that she shouldn't have said very rare. Well, you don't get both. You don't get to ask questions about children lying, but then not have her answer very rare at the same time. And at the same time- Well, I, when I think, I, I think I, I'd agree with you if they were responsive answers. 
but these were not responsive answers, right? I mean, he, he didn't open the door, the witness did. But I, I think if you look at his questioning before that, he kind of does open the door because he does ask about children lying, the research of children lying, of what causes them to lie, to make up things, if parent, parent or influential goes into that. So I, I think he really does open the door. While he doesn't directly say, how often do children lie? I think if you look at his questioning as a whole, it really does open the door to that. At the same time, from an ineffective assistance standpoint, you have to look at his strategy behind it. And the strategy was specifically that Rosens was testifying simply in generalities. She knows absolutely nothing about this specific victim in this specific case. And therefore, what her opinion is of generalities really doesn't matter for this victim. And even got Ms. Rosens to say that I don't believe anybody based off of these generalities. I have to actually talk to them. I didn't talk to her. So then, you know, at the same time, when counsel is now arguing, well, if they're, you know, going to believe the expert witness, well, the expert witness plain out says, I don't believe anybody just based on generalities. I have to talk to them. I have to hear what they actually say. And so the jury didn't go back and listen to what Ms. Rosen testified. They listened to the victim herself. They listened to what she said, what her statements were, and they debated on her credibility. So counsel kind of did get what they wanted. They, she may have believed the expert, but they believe the expert to look at her credibility and her credibility alone, not necessarily um, convict him based on generalities, generalities alone. I mean, and I think their verdict goes to that. I mean, they found him not guilty of accosting a minor, which I think if you're gonna say, well, general, I'm sorry, if we're gonna convict based on generalities alone, they would have convicted across the board, not necessarily guilty on one and not guilty on the other. Can you address uh, Mr. Millsat's argument that while Thorpe is factually distinguishable, it establishes effectively an ironclad rule that you just cannot go there in terms of talking about probabilities of children lying in this context. And that's where I think the court kind of is assisting me in this argument and that where do you, I mean, are you going to say that you can't say it's rare at all? Well, that's his argument. Is right. It, is that the rule? Or but not? that's where I think the rule is more, it's qualitative not a generality at all. Because in both of those cases, he talks about 2% or two to 4%. We're saying this is a very tiny, very tiny, minute amount. She's just saying in her research, what she's seen, it's very rare. I'm not putting a number on it. Um, counsel, I think said something to the effect of that the expert basically testified she's probably telling the truth, but Rosen didn't say that. Rosen didn't say anything about the victim or anything about the victim's credibility. She just simply said, that it is very rare for um, false reports in this case, or, or I'm sorry, yeah. false reports in child cases, which is essentially what trial counsel had been asking her over and over prior to that. Um, in, I guess if, if for the rest of that argument, I would rely on the remainder of my brief. I, I think this is very distinguishable from Thorpe, um, both qualitatively and the fact that I, I think the defendant actually waived this claim by counsel asking those questions. If you look at the ineffective assistance of counsel, I think that then looks at his strategy and the fact that he's trying to differentiate generalities from spe um, specifics in this case. Um, and looking in the, the cutting issue, um, counsel mentioned- I'll, I'll mention to you the same thing I mentioned before. And it's really the first issue. I mean- if, Right, I don't, I don't I disagree you with you. I think my brief covers both of the other arguments. So I guess if counsel, or sorry, if the court doesn't have other questions and I'll rely I on my brief. I don't. Oh, looks we're all set. Thank you. Thank you. So Sister Counsel summarizes the questioning of Holly Rosen by the defense. And I, I have it written down four times. Do children lie? Do children lie? That was the sum and substance of what he, is, he was getting at throughout some of his various questions. That's precisely the question that Thorpe answered in a negative when it was, uh, there was a ruling that that, that had opened the door to uh, uh, an assessment of how often children do lie. It's a yes or no question. And if you look at the specific questions that she was non-responsive to in her answer, um, the first one was, isn't it important to have a forensic interview instead of just any 
anybody. And she said, well, parents really, they could traumatize the children, but really the end, it, they, they very rarely lie to their children, their parents. That's, that was the answer to his question about forensic interviewing and the importance of it and the role of, of it there. So, which is not even the whole picture about why we have forensic, uh, the, the protocol. The whole purpose of the protocol is number one, to not traumatize the child, but number two, to get a truthful answer and not to get false reports. So she was misrepresenting that as well. Um, the second time was he said, do you ever have an instance where a complainant, um, it, it turns out that she's doing, doing it for attention? And she said, not really. I see them recant once in a while, but you know, that's usually because they get a little uh, freaked out, basically is what she said. I, she didn't say freaked out. And then she said, but then you know, false reports are very rare. She returned to that theme. They are very rare. Uh, now, if we're drawing, you know, this is, again, it's a distinction without a difference between what happened in Thorpe and what happened here. Very rare means a very low percentage, whether it's 10%, 15%. Um, and there, the, the case law, starting with Peterson, starting with even before Peterson, you cannot invade the province of the jury by bringing an expert to say, this is a common occurrence. This is not a common occurrence. As I said before, if the defense had tried to bring in an expert to say it was common, relatively common, very common for people to lie, that's just not something that would be allowed. And that's not something allowed in a case against a defendant where the jury, again, is really looking to what, who to whom to hang its hat on. They, they don't want to convict an innocent defendant, but they don't want to disbelieve a, a complainant. And where do they look? They look to an expert and the expert is reassuring them that the chances of this person telling a lie are pretty low. And it's very rare that this would happen. So you can believe her, you, can, you, are, re, you are reassured that you can convict Mr. Yats of this crime. So I would ask that you reverse and remand for a new trial. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you both. We appreciate it. Any questions? No. Okay. All right, no, thank you both very much. Uh, the matter is submitted. You're welcome. Turning to the next case, item three. Vermilia versus Delta College Board of Trustees, 356199. Don't see an appellant. Is there an appellant uh, who is to be by Zoom. remote? Zoom. Thank you. Attorneys Higgs and Jurcevic are endorsed, I think. Thank you. And they were both to appear by Zoom. All right, I think we're waiting for Ms. Higgs and Mr. Jurcevic. Judges, the parties are there. They just have to turn on their camera. All right. Thank you. Hello, Judge. I am going to uh, remain mute as Mr. Higgs will be handling all of the oral argument. All right. Very good. May have been your hope, Mr. Jurcevic, but unless we can get Mr. Higgs to appear. <laughs> I see um, I see him down at the bottom, yeah. and it's his first time that he's done this, so maybe he needs to unmute himself and hit the upper right-hand corner where it says start video. There we go. Thank you for your technical assistance. That's exactly right. There, we go. there he is, and I'm going to mute myself right now. Thank All right. You. Mr. Higgs, you're muted. You need to unmute yourself, Mr. Higgs. No. There you go. No. No. In the same vicinity where you started your camera and started video, there should be a, a way for you to unmute. Looks like a little microphone. Mr. 
Mr. Higgs, did you test your audio before um, before getting here? Because we can't hear you. Why, why don't we um, Why don't we do this? Let's. We're going to go back to this. We're going to hear another case, our next case, and after we hear that next case, we're going to come back to this one and see where we're at. Okay. Maybe our staff can help Mr. Sounds Higgs uh, figure out his problem in the meantime. Sounds good. And I will make a phone call and see if I can help. Okay. okay. We'll thank see you, you in probably a half hour or less. Hey, thank you. Right. So attorney now to the next item, item number four, AMA versus MWA 357438. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. May it please the court, Eric Shepard here on behalf of the respondent MWA in this case. Uh, because this is a personal protection order proceeding, I will simply refer to both petitioner and respondent um, as the initials uh, that are designated for this particular case. There you is one moment. Um, I'm just letting you know right now that I think you have the stronger argument. The uh, uh, Pelley's not uh, endorsed. So you can spend as much time as you want, but it, it appears as though that you, you have the stronger argument here. Thank you, Your Honor. I do want to just briefly just touch upon. Well, you get, that... you're, you're getting a lot of rope here, so it's up to you how much you want to take of it. <laughs> I, I understand, Your Honor. I, I certainly can rely upon I, I'm not sure you do, but go ahead. <laughs> I, I think you're in an excellent position on this case. All right, Your Honor. Then I will rest upon my brief, and I will let the court uh, make a decision, and uh, I would ask the court to reverse the decision of the trial court and to enter an opinion and order to that effect. Thank you. Thank you. Hope Thanks for not, appearing. In yeah. case we did have questions, yeah. it's important that you be here. So Thank you. we Thank appreciate you. it. Hope Thank you're you. not too disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you bet. All right. Let's um, let's not go back to the next case. I'm not unless we're lined up. Are we lined up for the next case? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Let's hear number seven, and then we'll go back to the case that we skipped due to the technical issues. All right. Let's let's hear on item number seven right now. Uh, which is Zawada versus Hogan. That's item seven, three, five, five, four, two, two. All right, sir, you actually, um, yes, how do you pronounce your last name? Zawada, very good. Sir, I know you're representing yourself. This is what I usually do for uh, folks that are representing themselves. Um, by all means, you're gonna have a hearing. Uh, obviously these are legal discussions. I see you're very prepared. Um, you have the right to speak first. I always suggest this for people who are pro per representing yourself. Uh, whether, you know, you have 30 minutes and you can, in, at the end, you've probably seen people save time at the end of the 30 minutes to have what's called rebuttal, to respond to what the other side says. We're familiar with everything. I'm gonna offer you an opportunity that you can either accept or reject. If you'd like, you can allow the uh, appellee her to speak first and spend all of your time responding to her, or you can speak first and then only have about five minutes to respond to what she says. What would you like to do? Would you like to have her go first and you be able to respond to everything? Would you like to go first? Okay, by all means, come, come right ahead. If you could please state your name and then uh, we'll hear from you. Okay, uh, my name is Arthur Zavada and I'm representing myself on a case 35422. Go right ahead. Um, I believe everything is based on common sense and logic. Okay, and those police officers, when they came to my house, they supposed to treat the symptoms of the situation instead of taking this to a council stage. They, they took it to a council stage. Okay. 
with good faith, I talked to them, I explained that the money is owed to me. Yes, I received the money from him to go get the parts. Parts were not ready. I get another job offer. It was my birthday. Uh, I communicated with him through the texts, asking for the, his address. He lied in police reports, initial police report. He manipulated texts and only gave partial texts in our communication and claimed that I, he made a hundred phone calls right. and he tried to talk to me. Well, he, the, the key in this case, at least the way I look at it, is right. the legal decision right. that the, the case, because you filed the civil action, right? right? The legal decision that the trial court made with regard to first the supervisor, kicking the supervisor out of the case, okay, the police supervisor. Right. And then the second issue is dealing with whether they were acting outside of jurisdiction, their jurisdiction, right. um, and whether they were entitled to make a citizen's arrest. Those are all legal, right. those are all legal issues. You're, you're focusing on the factual issues. Okay. We've, got, we've got the facts down. Okay, no problem. Co okay. Cover the legal issues. Okay, so first question, important question is why they came to my house. If they had all the information, they should just go to the uh, Judge Geddes, as Justice Forrest Warren, call me, you have to turn yourself in. Case is resolved. They don't have to come over to my house. And later on, three years later, they claimed that they made a citizen arrest. They, they arrested me illegally in my house. They claimed that I beat them up when they assaulted me in my own house. They rearrested me in the Livingston County Courthouse. And I was approached by the state trooper who told me that there's arrest warrant. But then I got exposed to the psychopath officer Hogan who took me to, to Washington sure, County Jail. Sure. But he told me that if I don't talk to him, he will add additional charge. One second. I think Judge Kavanaugh had a question. Judge Kavanaugh? Uh, we know these are the facts and we know about them. I think okay. I will say, why should you win? Just tell us why you win. Because why they were illegal win? in my house. Okay. They had no right to be in my house. I think I think that was the key question. What uh, what made the arrest illegal? You said they illegally arrested to, you in your house. Right, why was the right, arrest exactly. illegal? Why was okay, so the they arrest have to illegal? have a, they have to have a probable cause. They have to have exigent circumstances that they manufacture exigent circumstances. They manufactured. They lied that I was a flight risk. That my apartment was scarcely populated. I all right, we, we, we know I invited all him that. to the table so we can sit down and talk. And have a tea. They refused. I right. was interrogated because right. they, when they got me by the stairs to leading to upstairs, I wasn't able to move. They dragged me with the head down with my hands behind me in my pajama and a t-shirt without all the right. shoes. All right. Well, we understand the facts. We understand okay. what they so, you did know, what, to you. What way? And then later on, three years later, they claimed that they made a citizen arrest. I will give it to them if on the beginning in front of Judge Geddes and why Judge Geddes didn't question what you guys were doing in Washington County arresting people like a judge in, in Washington County asked what they were doing in Washington County arresting people. All right. Why don't we they hear from the other right side? To arrest me and now they try to twist this around, lie and, 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 and connive, okay, to figure out to get out of this, this predicament. Gentlemen. Okay. We got it. I think we understand. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to, you've got a lot of extra time, so we're going to be able to respond okay. to anything the other side says. Thank you. you Thank you. Go right ahead. Good morning, Your Honors. Holly Batters, on behalf of the Hamburg Township defendants. Um, I think the key here, probably the most easiest way to dispose of this is collateral estoppel. This very issue, the illegal arrest, was already decided in the criminal proceedings in the 15th District Court. This very argument that the officers were acting outside of their jurisdiction in arresting Mr. Zawada was decided by Judge mm -hmm. Valvo uh, in the 15th District Court. Uh, plaintiff was represented by very competent legal counsel mm -hmm. and sought a dismissal of his charges in Washtenaw County. Um, Judge Valvo looked at this. She looked at whether these Hamburg Township officers were justified in making the arrest in uh, Ann Arbor and decided that they were. Um, his counsel used 764.2a and argued that because they did not partner with an MSP trooper or officers from the county, uh, that the arrest was illegal. And the prosecutor argued, as I've argued in this case, there's another statute that should be looked at, 764.16, and that allows for the citizen's arrest. 
Um, so when Mr. Zawada says that this hasn't been raised for three years, it was, it was raised in the court below and Judge Valvo already decided the issue. So collateral estoppel, as you well know, precludes this civil court from undoing what the criminal court has already done. And Judge Valvo kept the case going. She denied Mr. Zawada's motion to dismiss and the case continued on until the prosecutor for reasons that aren't clear to me and are not clear to my officers dismissed the case on her own uh, motion. This court has issued opinions and decisions that Judge Valvo relied upon. There's very strong precedent from this court yeah. that um, explains why these officers were permitted to do what they did. Right. Uh, cases dating back 20, But well, you don't have 30. to go through all those. They're in your brief. Yeah, we've got it. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Thank you. Opposing counsel is so, so fond of a collateral estoppel, right? And if somebody can explain the collateral estoppel, it, to me, collateral estoppel applies to citizen arrest that was mentioned three years later. They cannot use a collateral estoppel three years later where they had an option in front of Judge Gettys on the first hearing. When I brought the check, I said, here's the money. This is a civil matter. Let's put this behind it, okay? But they decided to prosecute me. At that time, Judge Gettys didn't question them. Why did you guys go to Washtenaw County? Why did you make, uh, make arrest on illegal arrest with Mr. Zavada in Washtenaw County? Did Council you do a citizen are, arrest? Uh, so at that moment, my lawyer would be able to address this issue. I got a question for Judge Kevin. Yes. I want to just, just what, would you, what do you want us to do? What would you ask this court? Send it to do? back so people can hear my case. And then what? I mean, if the people decide that uh, either way, then I'll be fine with it. All right. All right. It's not asking too much, right? Right. All right. And I think it's under my right, okay, to for people in the civil case to be heard by the by the people. All right. We're going to take a very close look at this, and uh, and we'll get something out to you soon. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for appearing. We appreciate Thank you, it. Thank you both thank very you. much. All right. The matter is submitted. We're about at the time of our break. Why don't we do this? We're going to take uh, Judge Kavanaugh. Can we take a five minute break? And what I'm hoping to do is bring our, the parties in, then we can make sure that we can figure out the volume issue and the muteness, uh, the moot or mute. How about, <laughs> how about issue. four minutes and 37 seconds? Would that be okay? I, I, well, I, will, I will grant leave, yes. All right, all right, so ordered, so ordered. So ordered. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Mr. Hague, Mr. Hague, Mr. Hague, Mr. Hague, Mr. Hague, Mr. Hague. Are you able to turn your camera and volume on? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, now I can hear you. I just can't see you. Okay. Uh, and I, I have pressed the... Oh. Uh, oh. There you go. I can see you now and I can hear you. <laughs> okay, that's a relief. Okay, you, great. So I'm going to move you back into the attendees room, and then when they call your case, I'll move you back in. And is the volume all right? Yes. Yep. You I can great. hear you fine here. Can you hear the courtroom, yeah. sir? Yes. Okay. Very good. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Not a problem. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. 
Hopefully it feels better at first. Yeah. Hopefully it feels better at first. When I get here, I, I rarely talk more than a minute. I think I'll share with the class days when I get in here for sitting by. We'll, uh, we'll check uh, later in the shutdown. Thanks, I had a pause. Yeah, for how long? Uh, five minutes. And you have one last case for the day. Link working for the uh, judge from offsite that works for the we, we can't hear very much. You don't know how to bring the camera up. Yeah, I
no, no, I'm not going to go down. Our Trevor City office does. All right, uh, welcome back. Uh, we are gonna go back to item number three, is that correct? Item number three, which was called earlier, but there were some technical mm -hmm. problems. So that is uh, Familia versus Delta College Board of Trustees 356199. Morning, Your Honor. Can you hear me now? Yes, we yes. can hear you. It's All right. Nice. Thank you very much for your patience. I'm sorry that I had an issue here. I, had, I, I recently bought a new computer, and I guess I just didn't have it set up right. That's all right. Not a problem. Uh, well, as the appellant, um, uh, you can proceed. I think you've already pl placed your name on the record. If you haven't, go right ahead. All right. I, I will again. Kim Higgs on behalf of uh, the plaintiff appellant, uh, Harlan Vermilion. Uh, Your Honors, uh, I would first like to point out some dates here that are kind of significant. We're talking about nine years of violations of the Open Meetings Act. This, this court uh, entered its opinion uh, previously that, the, that Delta College did violate uh, two sections of the, uh, the Open Meetings Act on July 31st of 2018. And then... Um, these minutes were not brought into compliance until 17 and a half months after you rendered your opinion. They, the Delta College did absolutely nothing to conform to your opinion. And as a matter of fact, between then and now, we're talking about 33 months. They still haven't amended minutes that we suggested or requested be completed. There, during that nine years, there were eight meetings that uh, were not compliant. Um, four of those meetings were amended following a hearing in front of Judge Trice. 
uh, and those were from the years 3013. You know, a council, we couldn't save you the time. Judge Cameron had mentioned earlier, maybe you missed it, that we know these facts. All right. Uh, we could be all day on itemizing everything that happened. It just right. cut to the chase and tell us what we should do about it. All right. Uh, Your Honor, I, I recently found a quote that I believe aptly sums up the relief sought by the plaintiff's appellants in this case. And it's, uh, it was the case of Roe versus Board of Education at Chippewa Valley School District, which is 430 MESH 314. And uh, in this particular case, the Supreme Court said this, it is the providence of equity to afford full relief and protect all rights. Assuming that a transaction ought not to have taken place, the court proceeds as though it had not taken place and returns the parties to that situation. Conversely, when a party fails to do that, which is required by law, the remedy is to place the parties in a position as if there had been performance. And it's the latter that obviously we're seeking to achieve. Uh, we, it's our position that uh, the court is our, the, the trial court said that we presented unrefuted evidence that these violations occurred from 2007 there on. However, um, the court had denied our opportunity to amend our complaint and also uh, basically ignored uh, the, the evidence that we submitted uh, in response to the motion for summary disposition. Mm -hmm. And the court basically ignored the evidence that we presented uh, in when it found, when, when, it was, when it was reaching its conclusions. One of the big problems that I think happened here is is that this court suggested that there are two sections of the, of the statute that were violated. However, the trial court did not differentiate one from the other. And so uh, I think that was a great part of the problem uh, because then when it came to the relief, the judge said, we're gonna limit your relief to only that which you uh, requested in, in your first amendment complaint. Right. Right. And that, to me, is totally contrary to uh, what the court rules suggest. And as far as the relief that's requested, we can modify our request for relief anytime until today. Mr. Higgs, this case to me boils down to a single issue, and that is, why are you today entitled to an injunction when the defendant uh, has cured the problem. In other words, I, I, I'm not aware that there's an ongoing violation today but, of yes, recent but, vintage. You, you want to go back nine years and cite a lot of stuff we already know because I was on the panel and Vermilia won. So I, I'm well aware that you know there were violations, what we determined to be violations. It was a case of first impression. I think we made some law in that case. But so tell me why, because I, I think this is really the only issue in dispute. Why are you entitled to an injunction now when they've cured the problem? Uh, uh, Your Honor, they have not cured the problem. Um, there are still, as late as last night, I looked on the college's website. Their website includes a a um, archive of meeting minutes that go back to 2007. And that was one of the reasons why I felt it was appropriate time frame in terms of what's at issue in this case, not only because the Emsley case included the eight years time frame, we're requesting nine years time frame. But uh, the bottom line is, although they have a rectified uh, the, the, they have amended the minutes from the cases that were involved in Ader and uh, Vermilia and Andrich. They did. They made a comment in their in their uh, brief for summary disposition that they had gone back and corrected all the minutes before 2016. But that is not true. If you go back and if you were to look at it today, the information that the public is entitled to receive. They don't, that information is not there. Under the statute, they have an obligation to amend their minutes when there's a, a problem. 
Right. They haven't. They haven't done that, All and right. so consequently, it's our position. There's no. There's no statute of limitations on MCL MCL fifteen point two seven one, and so right. the issue is as viable today as it was then, because if any individual were to look at those minutes today, they potentially could have a, a, a separate cause of action because right. the information provided there is not full and complete. Right. And so consequently, I do not believe that they have fulfilled the requirements of the statute of your, of your opinion. Mm -hmm. that, that's, the, that's the bottom line is that All right. these are continuing violations. That have not been correct. Yeah, I think we've got it. Okay, thank you very much. And I'll reserve the rest of the time for. All right, thank you. Oh. Thank you. Good morning again to the panel, Douglas Curlow on behalf of the Delta College Board of Trustees. Uh, again, I will be very brief. I was satisfied with the brief I submitted. I'm a little confused where the nine years come from. I count 2007 to be 15 years. Yeah. We're actually looking at going back. Um, if Ader, Vermilia, Andrich, it was never asked that we do anything about minutes in, 20, in 2007, 2008. The college did everything that it was ordered to do, everything it was asked to do in the complaints. The question is whether there's a need now to have an injunction put in place. Uh, I just want to make one point in oral argument. It's rather ironic that the plaintiffs cite the Citizens for a Better Algonac school case because that points out that even in the OMA situation, Injunctive relief remains extraordinary, and it's in the discretion of the court. Judge Jackson wrote an excellent and comprehensive opinion, and I think that opinion should be affirmed. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Not, you much, not much to rebut there. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, the bottom line is I think you have to look at the stated intent of the OMA, of the Freedom Information Act, and... Uh, the, the duties and responsibilities under the Community College Act, they simply have not fulfilled their obligations. They have not gone back. Today, the people, Mr. Vermilia and John Q. Public, are being denied access to information that they're All entitled right. to have. All right. All right. Thank you. Understood. Thank you. I have no questions, Judge Cameron. All right. Anything? No. All right. Thank you both uh, very much. Uh, the matter is submitted. Thank you. That was wrong. Nine is tomorrow. Right. Okay. Sorry. So I think we're now turning to item number eight, uh, which is the last item on the docket, uh, which is three five eight three five one and three five eight three five three consolidated. In Ray Hildebrandt Burnett Miners and In Ray Hildebrandt Miner. Uh, no parties are endorsed, uh, therefore the matter is submitted. Uh, that concludes the docket for today. Uh, Judge Kavanaugh, 10 minutes? Sure, but, yeah, fine. Okay. okay, see everybody in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, thank you very much.